Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kimberly Fowler. I am the Technical Assistance and Research Director here at the National Council of Urban Indian Health. Um, I really appreciate all of you attending today. Um, we are here to actually uh, uh, listen to this listening session on eliminating hepatitis C and HIV in Indian country, a focus on Indian health, urban Indian health. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. We are uh, streaming this live, so there are uh, virtual attendees that are uh, on the line listening, um, also willing to give their feedback and input. And so I also want to provide them with a few housekeeping notes as well so that they know how to be able to do that. Um, so there is a participant chat box uh, in the Adobe screen um, located on the lower left hand of your uh, screen. Please feel free to write into that chat pod any questions, comments at any time throughout the session. We will have a Q&A time period for you to be able to then provide that information. Um, and this is just a, a schematic of that. You are able to also raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, um, we will be able to open the mics for you to speak. Um, once again, you can write into the chat pod at any point in time. Um, and during the Q&A, we will uh, leave that time open for you to speak if you are uh, hoping to do so. Um, thank you again. So the National Council of Urban Indian Health is a membership-based nonprofit organization that represents the 41 urban Indian health organizations, also called UIOs, um, that are located across the nation that provide essential health and social services to American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban settings. This session is being virtually live streamed across the nation to many of our urban native stakeholders and partners working across Indian country to eliminate the high prevalence of HIV and hepatitis C in our American Indian and Alaska native communities in urban areas. We thank you to those here in person and for taking the time out of your day to join us. To get us started, I would like to introduce Ms. Frances Crevier who serves as Executive Director of the National Council of Urban Indian Health. Ms. Creviel, who is Algonquin, has been serving Indian country for more than a decade. She has served in various capacities from clerking for tribal Supreme Courts and working for the United Nations. Ms. Creviel has a JD from the University of Arizona Law with a certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law. After Ms. Crevia's remark, we will hear from Rick Havercate, who serves as the National HIV, AIDS, and Hepatitis C Program Director at the Indian Health Service. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kimberly, so much um, for that introduction. And thank you. Or not. Okay, now thank you so much for joining us today. Before, that was just a practice room. Um, as Kimberly stated, my name is Francis Crevier, and I'm the executive director at Nakui. Proud, proud executive director at Nakui. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to everyone who's taken the time out of your normally busy schedules. And for this mic, if it could just keep on, that would be great. If it doesn't one more time, I'm taking yours, Rick. Um, <laughs> Now it just tried me again. Um, we are excited to host this event to bring um, everyone together to, um, with our value partners and stakeholders to share their best practices, efforts, and to strategize future opportunities to improve the collective impact on this concerning issue. This listening session will focus on allowing urban Indian health programs across the United States a platform to ex express their community's circumstances, needs, identify gaps, and to share their perspectives and interests with others who are diligent, diligently working to support the Eliminating Hep C and HIV in Indian Country initiative. Nakui is a 501c3 organization that supports our 41 urban Indian health programs. Um, throughout 59 sites in 22 um, states. These UIHPs were created by Congress to fulfill the federal government's health care related responsibility for Indians who live off of the reservations. Nakui's members provide health care to the substantial part of that fast growing American Indian Alaska Native population who lives in metropolitan urban areas rather than reservations and with more than 70 percent of Native folks now living in reservations as compared to the 45% in the, in the 1970s and 8% in the 1940s, UHPs are a critical component of the of this system. In February 2019, the current administration announced the Ending HIV Epidemic, a Plan for America initiative, with a primary goal 
to reduce new HIV infections in the United States by 75% in five years and by 90% in 2030. Additionally, in March 2019, IHS introduced and highlighted the Eliminating Hep C and HIV in Indian Country Initiative under the administration's plan. The President's fiscal year 2020 budget proposed $25 million in new investments to expand partnerships between IHS and Native communities to end the HIV epidemic in Indian Country. We are looking forward to a strong partnership between federal agencies and urban Indian health programs to reduce the rates of Hep C and HIV AIDS in Indian Country. Survival rates for Native peoples living with HIV and AIDS are lower than any other population. Additionally, Native peoples who have been diagnosed with this most often suffer from related diseases such as diabetes, tuberculosis, and hepatitis. Mental health, substance abuse, and addiction complicate primary care-seeking behaviors of Native people with HIV. Data has shown that HIV diagnosis have steadily increased in Indian country over the past few years. Across the country, UHPs provide culturally competent care and services and resources that are critical to addressing these healthcare challenges while struggling with constant underfunding. Although UIHPs are successfully implementing innovative measures to combat HIV and viral hepatitis for their patients, um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are ranked four in the nation for new HIV diagnosis and insufficient funding of programs directed at this crisis continues to be an issue. Additionally, it has been proven that reoccurring health problems are more acute for natives living in urban areas. Urban Indians have greater rates of mortality from chronic disease compared to all other races. Urban Indians are also less likely to receive preventative care compared to the non-Indian urban population and less likely to have health insurance. It was like, be quiet, Francis, stop talking. I'm almost done. Uh, this is why today's conversation is so important. Nakui is excited to know that IHS has implemented this critical initiative. However, it is important for IHS to hear directly from you, the UIHPs, to truly understand the needs of the programs and Native patients in urban areas. As IHS and CDC apply for additional funding to reduce infections and provide resources, we urge them to consult and engage with UIHPs to ensure that urban Indian health care is able to provide the same quality of care as the other partners within the IHS ITU system. Again, thank you, so all, thank you all so much for coming. We are very excited to discuss this extremely important um, issue. As now, now I'm going to hand it off to our two moderators, Dr. Kimberly Fowler and Julia Dreyer. Thank you, Francis. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Julia Dreyer, and I'm the Director of Federal Relations at NACUI. We received a welcome from Senator Warren's office in support of this listening session, which I will share now to get things kicked off. Senator Warren states, combating hepatitis C and HIV AIDS in communities most impacted by these epidemics, including American Indians and Alaska Natives in urban centers, must be a top priority for lawmakers. Methamphetamine and opioid use have been key drivers of rising hepatitis C and HIV AIDS rates in Indian country and across the United States. That is why I introduced the Comprehensive Addiction Resources Emergency, or CARE Act, ambitious legislation to tackle the opioid and substance use epidemic head on. The CARE Act, which is modeled after the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, would invest $100 billion over 10 years to fight this epidemic including over $800 million annually provided directly to tribal governments, tribal epidemiology centers, urban Indian health organizations, and other entities ser serving Native communities. I appreciate Nakui's support for the CARE Act. The Indian Health Service should never have to cut corners to address hepatitis C and HIV AIDS, behavioral health, and other pressing health issues, and its work, as well as that of urban Indian health programs, should never be jeopardized by dysfunction in Congress. That's why I am also working with Congressman Deb Holland to develop legislation, the Honoring Promises to Native Nations Act, to ensure the federal government lives up to its trust and treaty obligations. Among other important proposals, this legislation would, pr would provide full guaranteed funding for IHS, and it would invest heavily in tribal epidemiology centers. We appreciate the support coming from Congress, as well as Senator Warren's um, office, on this important topic. 
We will now hear an update from the Indian Health Service on HIV and hepatitis C prevention and treatment, which will be presented by Rick Havercate, the National HIV AIDS and Hepatitis C Program Director at IHS. Rick Havercate is an enrolled member of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians and has been working in the field of HIV AIDS with American Indian Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander populations for 30 years. His numerous roles have included community health educator, public health advisor, and director of public health at the tribal, state, and national levels. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. I think I might need to have the clicker yeah. for the slides. Probably easier if I just sit here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here, and I bring you uh, greetings from our director, uh, principal deputy director of the Indian Health Service, uh, Rear Admiral Michael Wiaki. Uh, Admiral Wiaki couldn't be here today. He's preparing for his Senate confirmation hearings, which are scheduled for tomorrow. Also, his wife, Dr. Rose Wiaki, uh, who serves as our urban Indian lead at Indian Health Service, is busy, as you can imagine assisting with the gathering of family for that event. Uh, I'll do my best to provide an overview of HIV and hepatitis C in Indian country and let you know a bit about what IHS has been up to, especially since the uh, announcement of the ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America. Thank you. Um, uh, I think Americans with Disabilities Act should include colorblindness. Because <laughs> when someone says green button, I'm like, I don't, that doesn't look green to me. But thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> so a couple of things I'd like to get across in our very quick 10-minute uh, presentation. I'd like you to learn and remember what the main goal of ending the HIV epidemic is, or we'll call it the plan, sometimes just EHE for short list the four key strategies of the plan, which are aimed to reduce new HIV infections in the U.S., and describe what treatment as prevention, or TASP, is all about. You might also hear things like U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. The stats in Indian country are a little depressing. Uh, we know that we've had about a 63% increase in rates of HIV among gay and bisexual American Indian and Alaska Native men. And those rates come from the Centers for Disease Control, who we rely on heavily for our, our data. And we know that we have an undiagnosed rate for AIA and living with HIV hovering around 18%. That's a very important number to remember because we need to make sure that people who have HIV are diagnosed as early as possible. Uh, the general population in the U.S. is hovers somewhere around 12 to 15%. And roughly 53% of all American Indian Alaska Natives diagnosed with HIV are receiving continuous care, which is lower than the national average, which pushes around 59-60%. Very important that we keep people in care, get them into care as soon as possible, and keep them in care. Uh, just a little disclaimer about data. This is not all IHS-generated data. It's almost impossible to collect data on American Indians and Alaska Natives from the Indian Health Service point of view. We rely heavily on our partners uh, in other parts of the federal government. We do a very good job collecting data for those American Indian Alaska Natives who seek out care and treatment at an IHS federally run facility. Where we have some issues is getting data from tribally operated and urban operated health centers. We don't share the same databases. We don't share the same electronic health records. So most of the time today I'll be talking about data we receive through CDC. This won't be surprising that about 80% of our cases of HIV in Indian country uh, come from uh, cases between a men who have sex with men. Although, please remember that we do have a large number of American Indian Alaska Native women with HIV. It's about three times the rate of white women. And especially where we diverge with American Indian women is through some of the transmission routes. A lot of our transmission routes for HIV are through injection drug use, and most oftentimes, if it's through sex, it's often reported to be through intimate partner violence. So it's important to remember that we do have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We, and now is the time. In the State of the Union address in February, the President announced um, a $219 million budget increase, a proposed budget increase for ending the HIV epidemic, where CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, NIH, uh, and IHS all stand to receive 
substantial amounts of money to really help us get started in ending the HIV epidemic. It's proposed that IHS receive $25 million. The budget is not finalized yet. That money is not in the bank yet. We're deciding uh, what kinds of activities might happen, and that's why a listening session like this is so important. IHS has made no commitments, has given no uh, concrete answers to anyone, not even in-house really what will happen with the $25 million. We're going to wait until we do tribal consultation and urban confer sessions. There's about 700,000 Americans currently living, uh, I'm sorry, whose lives have been lost to HIV since we started taking records about 30 or 40 years ago. There's about 1 million currently living with HIV. This is Americans in general. And there's about 40,000 new HIV diagnoses each year. If I had a chart, you'd see that we had a large increase in new HIV infections and it drastically fell. But it's hovered around that 40,000 level for five or six years now. And that's why the folks uh, under the leadership of the secretary came together and said, what can we do? We, we must do something about this. Why are we continuing to show these 40,000 new cases of HIV each year? And we spend about $20 billion a year uh, around HIV prevention and care. <clears throat> so uh, they got together and thought, what can we do about this? We have the tools. We have the talent. We have the skills. We have the ability to end the HIV epidemic. But do we have the willpower? Are our resources aligned correctly? Are our communities prepared to do the work? So that is what our program is all about. The goal is to reduce by 75% the number of new infections in five years. And over 10 years, we want to reduce that by at least 90%. We have the tools, the data, the medical research. We're not waiting, as the Secretary says, we're not waiting for any new miracles to happen. We have. Uh, medications that when we get people into care and treatment who are living with HIV on their antiretroviral therapies, they can be uh, at an undetectable viral load. It means the virus is not detectable in their blood through a standard HIV screen. And when they get to that undetectable level, they are incapable of transmitting the virus. So U equals U. Undetectable equals untransmittable. Amazing feat of science. We also have PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. For those who are at risk for HIV but not currently living with HIV, one pill once a day gives about a 97% um, effective rate of the person not being able to get HIV. So between those two things, called treatment as prevention, if we treat people with HIV and if we get people on PrEP who are at risk for HIV, that's the way we're going to get to the the a 90% reduction over 10 years. We can do it in Indian country. I just recently listed PrEP, uh, Truvada as PrEP, as pre-exposure prophylaxis on our formulary. Tribes and urbans can um, take advantage of some of those benefits. Uh, in addition to it being on our formulary at IHS facilities, uh, HHS just announced last week uh, a new program called, um, please help me. <laughs> I've, you'd think I'd remember, remember that. Ready, set, prep. Anybody <laughs> heard about that yet? Have you seen the public uh, information campaigns, Facebook, Twitter? Uh, I mean, I hope you have all seen it, or at least you'll hear about it and remember it from today on. Ready, set, prep. There's been a, a donation of 200,000 uh, prescriptions of prep over the next uh, 10, 20 years, tw 10, 10 years. Thank you. I have to call on my CDC folks in the audience and secretary folks. Free of charge. So if those uh, American Indian Alaska Native folks are coming to your urban clinics and uh, asking for PrEP, or if you do uh, uh, patient evaluation and you deem them an appropriate uh, recipient of PrEP, there's free PrEP. And we can, I can help you personally figure out how to get those drugs into your clinic, get them to that client. Uh, incredible, incredible donation. And there's no reason that your patients who want to be on PrEP shouldn't be on PrEP. I mentioned earlier some of the agencies that are focusing on this activity, CDC, HRSA, IHS, National Institutes of Health, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, and SAMHSA. A lot of folks are hearing about this geographic focus, or what we're calling the phase one geographic focus. We know that about 48 uh, constituencies around the country, in addition to the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, see more than half of all of the new cases of HIV. There are a little over 3,000 counties in the U.S. I think about 3,007, give or take. But 48 of those counties contain more than 50% of our new cases. We have a focus area. 
Uh, we also included seven of the rural states that are mostly in the south. Uh, we didn't want to just look at urban communities. No offense to the urban folks. <laughs> Super <laughs> offended, Rick. <laughs> but we knew you were important. You That's were the right. first ones that shined through on this map. But then we knew we had to add the rural communities in. So we weren't just looking at raw numbers. These are prevalence rates in some of these southern states, um, Oklahoma, one of them, where we have a large population of American Indian Alaska. And so with some of the funds that IHS received last year, not part of the ending the HIV epidemic, not part of that $25 million, but because of funding that comes from the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. IHS competes each year for some funds. And this year we received funds that uh, started a pilot project with the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, where they've got $1.5 million to um, start the process and be sort of our focus of how we could do this if we broadcast it more nationally. So we're looking at the Cherokee Nation to see how EHE, or even HIV epidemic, can be done in Indian country. We also um, have funds that are supporting the National Indian Health Board to do community listening sessions, tribal consultations, and we also were able to fund the National Council of Urban Indian Health to do sessions like this around the country because we need to hear what's going on um, in the local areas, including the urban folks, to see where we need to concentrate not just where the dots are, but the people and the agencies that represent those dots. The key strategies of the plan, we want to diagnose all people as early as possible. We want to treat people with HIV rapidly. We want to prevent new transmissions. That's mostly going to be done through things like PrEP. We want to respond quickly. In that response pillar, we were also able this year to fund uh, our tribal, nine of our tribal epicenters, of which there are 12. We are funding nine of them to do groundwork on helping tribes and urbans get prepared for looking at the data. So helping us, do we need to have new dots on that map? Um, do we need to increase activities where those dots already are? So that's what the tribal epicenters will be helping us do. Uh, there's two different groups that receive money with the tribal epicenters, depending if they represented one of those dots or not. And I don't mean to minimize by just saying a dot. I know there's real people living in real cities, but um, it's just easier for me than listing out all the cities. But we, we, we know that uh, we needed to fund those groups with, which contain those uh, phase one jurisdictions at a little higher level than we needed to fund those who don't represent directly those jurisdictions. Most of all, we know we need to listen to our communities. And in for some of our listening sessions already, we've heard a lot more than just talking about HIV care and treatment and getting people on PrEP. We've heard stories of real life individuals who the difficulty they have getting to clinics, the difficulty they have in overcoming their stigma, stigma around uh, living with HIV, stigma around LGBT and two-spirit populations, stigma from providers who don't, aren't comfortable, don't know enough about treating HIV. So we're funding things like Project ECHO, uh, where we're training providers via telehealth to be uh, able to treat effectively people who are living with HIV to prescribe PrEP. We're starting a new ECHO just around trans health. So we're doing a lot of things that are, are bringing information to the communities without our, our um, providers needing to take time off work and traveling. So that's all about listening to our communities. Uh, that was all I have for today. I didn't get a chance to even talk about hepatitis C. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that. We have uh, some of the highest rates in the country with hepatitis C. In fact, I think American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest rate of any other racial or ethnic group. We die at higher rates for hepatitis C, highest liver cancer rates, uh, but we have a cure for hepatitis C. That's also on our formula at IHS clinics. So people should be able to come into an IHS-run facility if you qualify get on the medicine that within eight to 10 weeks, one or two pills a day will completely cure them of hepatitis C. A lot of stigma around hepatitis. Most of our transmissions are through injection drug use. Uh, we're seeing a lot younger population than the general American society uh, with H hepatitis C. So we instituted, I think we were some, one of the first groups in the country to institute universal screening for hepatitis C. We're advocating that everyone who comes into an IHS clinic who's at least 18 years old get at least one screen in their lifetime for hepatitis C. And then we get them into care as soon as possible and cure them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rick, for that comprehensive update. 
It sounds like IHS is engaged in some critically important activities, and we look forward to partnering with IHS to ensure that these initiatives reach urban Indian organizations. Next, we are going to move on to the topic of HIV and hepatitis C prevention and treatment services that urban Indian organizations provide. Um, so in a recent survey uh, conducted by NUKUI, uh, UIHPs actually reported that the services they provide are making an impact upon their urban communities they serve. And although insufficient funding is an issue, UHPs are able to conduct ongoing uh, activities to fight HIV and HCV while finding opportunities to increase access to American Indian Alaska Native patients. Some of these services include testing for free at community events and powwows, becoming a syringe exchange harm reduction site, treating HIV HCV in the primary care setting, becoming an opt out HIV HCV clinic, educating, training, and making referrals for physical assistance, offering community-based overdose prevention education, and training and enabling staff to openly discuss high-risk situations with patients, provide feedback, and make appropriate referrals. In addition, many UHPs have reported having excellent care coordination relationships with community clinics, such as Ryan White providers, uh, also transportation services, specialists, and other partners focused on HIV, HCV healthcare. We will next hear from several UHP leaders regarding HIV, HCV prevention and treatment activities firsthand. First, Robin Sunday Allen and Dr. Dana Brown will provide a clinical overview from the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. Ms. Sunday Allen Cherokee is the CEO of the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. She oversees a staff of over 165 nurses, physicians, and support staff to provide comprehensive medical and behavioral health services to all tribal members in central Oklahoma. Ms. Sunday Allen earned a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Oklahoma and first joined the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic in 1995 as an RN. Lieutenant uh, Commander Danica Brown earned a Doctor of Pharmacy degree in 2011 from Southwestern Oklahoma State University and a Master of Healthcare Administration in 2019 from Oklahoma State University. She has been a commissioned officer in the United States Public Health Service since 2013 and is a Lieutenant Commander. At Oklahoma City Indian Center, Lieutenant Commander Brown is the Pharmacy Hepatitis C Clinic Manager and participates in five other pharmacy-based clinics. I will now turn it over to uh, Ms. Sunday Allen and Lieutenant Commander Danica Allen. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. Well, thank you, Nakui, and all of our partners for being here and for allowing us to share our story from the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. It became very apparent listening to our clinical staff that we needed to be in the forefront of hep C eradication and HIV. And that's exactly what we've done. We've taken a, a team approach to this. We actually have a prevention specialist that works with special populations. And we started our hep C eradication clinic with a physician champion. And that quickly turned to um, moving that clinic into the pharmacists. Our pharmacists act as clinicians in our setting, and it just seemed like a better fit. I'll let uh, Dr. Brown talk to you about some of the health outcomes, but one of the things that I think is most important on the policy side and as an administrator is to get behind this and to support the staff um, to make this happen because it's going to take all of us to reach those goals. Those were lofty goals that Rick talked about in his presentation, but I certainly think we can do that when you look at the data that we've been able to turn out at our clinic in Oklahoma City. Um, we have had great outcomes with Epclusa and Harvoni, and um, our prevention specialist actually works directly with the drug, com drug companies that have indigent care programs. And the reason why we've been so successful is she dares them to say no on denials, and you'll be able to see some of the data on that. And this past year, we added PrEP to our formulary and uh, have been doing universal HIV screenings for quite some time. And I'm uh, very proud of those services that we've been able to provide. So without further ado, I certainly don't want to take anything away from Danica's presentation of what she, uh, the clinicians have been able to do in the clinic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> do you want me to? 
thank you. Um, as Robin mentioned, our hepatitis C clinic began uh, in 2016, and it was a phys physician championed clinic. Um, and so it's evolved quite a bit since then. The process you see on the slide is a process that we began in August of 2018 um, when I learned about ECHO and it kind of ramped up at Oklahoma State University. Um, and we were able to work together with the physician and prove that um, as pharmacists, we could take this over and increase access, which I will touch on later. So um, a patient is first diagnosed with um, hepatitis C from their primary care provider, and then they're referred to our um, HCV pharmacy clinic. Uh, the patient is contacted by myself, and we schedule an initial pretreatment visit. During that pretreatment visit, uh, we go over how they contracted hepatitis C, um, sometimes educating the patient on how they contracted hepatitis C. Um, when they were first diagnosed, their prior treatment history, if there is any, and their drug use history. Uh, we then go over their lab work together and order any additional labs if that's needed. And then I counsel the patient on essentially this process that I'm going through um, with you now. Then all patients are uh, presented to the Oklahoma State University Project ECHO Hepatitis C Tele-ECHO. Um, I think it's very important that all patients, um, no matter their um, comorbidities, are presented to ECHO. Um, there's Definitely no reason that a pharmacist could not skip this step, but I feel like it's a very important step um, to just ensure and get that solid recommendation on what's best for them and their situation. So once we receive those recommendations back from ECHO, we go through the medication procurement process. Uh, for those patients without insurance, um, we refer them to our patient assistance coordinator. Uh, if they do have insurance, uh, then the prescription is sent to the pharmacy billing department and the prior authorization process is begun. Um, I have yet to see an insurance company that does not require a prior authorization uh, process to um, procure these medications. After the medication is received, the patient's contacted, and then we have our initial medication visit. Um, we review proper use and possible side effects of the treatment. They are then seen monthly through their last refill to ensure compliance uh, and to review any side effects or issues that they're having with the medication. Finally, the patient's contacted 12 weeks after they complete their therapy, or also known as SVR12. A lab visit is scheduled the labs are completed and a final hepatitis A and or B vaccine is given if indicated. When results are received, the patient is notified and a cured status is given. If the patient is not cured, then the patient re-enters the process at the echo stage and goes back through um, that same timeline. So this is a breakdown of where um, patients are in our treatment process. Um, these numbers are from inception, and we've seen a total of 409, 400, 249 patients totaling in 522 pharmacy visits. Um, just to point out a couple possibly staggering numbers that are up there, um, all but three of the 36 open consults have been contacted once, if not twice, for scheduling for their initial pretreatment visit or have no showed for their initial pretreatment visit and have not showed interest in rescheduling that visit. Um, and so often when they no show, as you all know, we call two or three times, we send a letter um, and they just don't come back. Um, and then patients who have not started, uh, which is at 21, um, have had their initial pretreatment visit and are either awaiting echo recommendations, a liver ultrasound, and or medications from patient assistance. Um, I would like to note that the patient assistance process is possibly the most um, patient dependent part of the process. Um, there's paperwork they have to fill out and then there's um, income paperwork they have to turn in as well. And so um, a lot of times we can't get a hold of them to let them know this is the step they're on or um, they get the paperwork and then they never bring it back. Um, so just as of recently, probably in the last month or so, um, I've started scheduling visits with the patient to fill out this paperwork um, and tell them what I need them to bring with them to the visit. Um, I feel like it's helpful. Um, we fill it out right then, print it off, they sign it, um, 
we have internet access and a computer and a printer so they can print uh, any W-2s or anything like that that they might have access to. Um, and it's all done right then. Um, and I think it's helping. So um, our, our cure rate per intent to treat is 67% uh, with N equaling 211. Um, of the 33% that are not cured, some have yet to complete treatment or are not due for their final lab work. So um, just a little background, intent to treat is anyone who has had any contact with treatment whatsoever. So that 33% also includes patients who came in, got one month of treatment, and then never came back, or um, we can't find them to get their SVR 12. Um, and so that's all included in that intent to treat population. If we delve further into patients who have completed therapy and reached SVR 12 um, and have come back and gotten that lab work done, um, Oklahoma City Indian Clinic has a 98% cure rate, which is the same percent cured per protocol as seen in real world studies. So we're going to look at some dollar amounts um, now. So for patients who have insurance, the clinic procures the drug and seeks reimbursement. Um, just of note, the Harvoni number is probably the highest um, just because we've been using it the longest. It's the drug that we started with. Um, and so I would say that's probably the only reason it's higher than the others. Um, so this is something that Robin touched on is our prescription assistance programs. We've saved almost $600,000 by using patient assistance programs, and we've treated 192 patient, 92, 132 patients um, through the patient assistance programs. Just some um, lessons learned as we've evolved through our clinic. Um, Easier access, I think, for anything, not just hepatitis C, um, improves your adherence to visits, to treatment, to lab work. Um, we did a study last year um, from moving to the direct-to-pharmacist referral process. We were able to decrease the average wait time to initial pretreatment visit by 20 days, um, which I think is, is huge for this population because you never know when they're going to move um, and you get them when you have them. Um, you know, efficiently navigating the patient assistance programs is also huge as well. Um, and then I think our biggest lesson learned is despite removing barriers to treatment, um, patients have still yet to recognize the importance of treatment. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've had someone tell me they can't tell they have hepatitis C or they are diagnosed and they're, you know, have no idea and then they, um, you know, since they don't have side effects, they don't think it's doing anything to them. So um, just educating patients on the dire need for treatment is, is huge so that they understand the uh, benefit of what you're giving them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sundy Allen and Dr. Lieutenant Commander Brown. Next, we will hear from Carrie hark Lassard regarding community support and Walter Murillo on an overview of current policy. Carrie hark Lassard is the Executive Director of Native American Lifelines, which operates facilities in Baltimore and Boston. Ms. hark Lassard is an applied, me applied medical anthropologist whose work explores the intersection of health and culture specifically the ways in which historical trauma impact the health status of contemporary Native people. At Native American Lifelines, Ms. hawk Lassard leads a team of dedicated individuals who are committed to improving the lives of its constituents. Following Ms. hawk Lassard, we will hear from Walter Murillo, who is a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and has been at Native Health for over 20 years. He has been the CEO of, since 2010 and currently oversees approximately 200 employees at five facilities. Mr. Murillo is regarded throughout the American Indian community as a pioneer and a champion and received the Local Impact Award from the National Indian Health Board in 2017.
Okay, well, thank you everyone again. My name is Carrie Hawk Lassard. I'm the Executive Director of Native American Lifelines, and um, I'm happy to be here today. Um, there's our wonderful logo. Um, so, Native American Lifelines is a Title V urban Indian health program. We're headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland, but we also serve the Boston, Massachusetts community. Um, I wanted to share our mission, uh, which is that uh, aligned with uh, IHS's overall mission, but it's to promote health and social resiliency in our communities. Um, and we use principles of trauma-informed care to do our work. Uh, we provide culturally-centered behavioral health work, dental services, and then outreach and referral services. So as an outreach and referral, we do not provide any direct medical services. And so we are primarily tasked to do a lot of health promotion disease prevention work, but we really depend on the relationships that we have with community health providers, whether they are local health departments or federally qualified health centers. Um, I came to this work, I started doing HIV prevention work in um, 1995, I'm that old. I started working with uh, HIV positive Haitian immigrants living in South Florida and applied the lessons that I learned there, really looking at the way that um, culture and history of, of that group impacted their health decision-making behavior, the types of treatment that they would engage in, but just really shape the, the health care um, and the risk um, profile of the community. So I brought that home to the work that I, I did. I spent 13 years working at Chase Brexton Healthcare, which is a federally qualified health center in Baltimore, doing um, HIV outreach and working on trans uh, medicine protocols. Um, so I, I was really happy to bring that skill set um, with me to Native American Lifelines. Um, so just a bit about uh, American Indians in Baltimore, and, and I'm gonna focus on the, the work in Baltimore because I'm going to talk about um, a CSAP grant that we participated in, uh, but just keep in mind that a lot of the programs that we do, most of the programs we do are, are uh, consistent across the Baltimore and the Boston site. So um, the, we have about 2,300 American Indians, Alaska Natives alone in Baltimore, according to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2010. Um, larger than that, uh, a little better than 3,500 uh, in combination. But we're 0.37% of the total population. Uh, the major majority of tribes, according to the census, are Cherokee, um, by self-report. Um, Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina represent a big part of our population. And then we have more members of Navajo Nation living in our community. So that's who we're, we're seeing. Um, 20.3% of urban Indians in general live in poverty compared with just 12.7% of the urban population. So, you know, we're, we're really seeing the, the same kinds of problems that people would see regardless of race, but they're amplified. And we're experiencing profound health disparities in our community, uh, type 2 diabetes, cancer, cardiac disease. Um, but what we focus on, uh, particularly in our program, is substance abuse and alcohol abuse, as well as mental distress. I was looking at data. Um, so over 81% of the, the clients that we see in our program are engaged in um, behavioral health programs. Uh, primary diagnosis is usually opioid over uh, uh, opioid abuse with a second most frequent diagnosis of alcohol um, abuse and I think it's important to note that in 2018 um, 24 percent of our clients fatally overdosed on opioids um, and when we talk about budget and you know when you think about tribal opioid response and how urbans aren't aren't eligible um, you know that that kind of colors the way you might think of data um, so the location of residents for native people the majority of us live outside of our reservation communities and and one of the wonderful things about the office of urban Indian health programs is that it does reflect the ways that native people have been moved around the country whether by policies or, or seeking uh, educational or employment opportunities now the, the red there is where um, urban native folks live um, that tiny slice of red right there is the percentage of the overall IHS budget that goes to where urban folks live. And I actually learned from Nakui, it's actually less than 1% at this point in time. So again, just really a stark way of understanding that the, the smallest amount of funding is where 
where is going to where the majority of Native people live, and that's important in our discussions about health and prevention. Um, so in um, 2007, I had the opportunity uh, as a graduate student to participate in a CSAT program um, led by Drs. Jeanette Johnson, who's a uh, Huron, Dr. Shelley V. Kelt, and Jan Grzynski, um, and it was called the Don't Forget About Us Project, but what it was looking at is sort of the way that um, trauma impacted urban Indian community members and how that contributed to kind of the health demoting behavioral practices that we engaged in as a community. Um, as a member of the Baltimore American Indian community, that was something that was of interest to me personally. I wondered why um, substance abuse behaviors had such a, sort of an intractable impact on our community and why we were, were not doing so, so well as maybe we could be. And so through that study, what we saw, the primary risk factors uh, in our community uh, were the sense of community disintegration, uh, big experiences of shame, stigma, urban lifestyle and peer influences. And, and what's sort of meant by that, for example, when I'm working with our, our youth and we're doing culture as prevention programs, we get those kids for maybe two hours a week. And the influence, you know, we're trying to surround them with our traditional values, our native culture, but then they go back into environments where that's not seen, that's not respected. And so the influences of the urban environment that they live in, unfortunately, often have more sway on their lives than, than the cultural values that we transmit to them. And then the socio economic disadvantage that they're experiencing as urban people. Um, and so we saw that a profound factor uh, in, in sort of the health decision-making behaviors or, or the reasons that people said that they used track back to trauma. Um, I'm not going to read this, but um, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart sort of has the gold standard of historical trauma definitions. Um, and just She's looking at, and we're looking at, the losses that Native people have experienced really in a short period of time. So loss of land, loss of culture, loss of agency, loss of language. Um, you know, the loss of even the right to our, our own identity and our, our likeness. And then uh, Dr. Joe Gon, who's now at Harvard, um, also reflects the loss of language and culture that really um, leave Native people feeling in a disoriented place um, you know, in their environment. Um, some, some feedback from community members during that study, consistently they talked about the loss of culture as, as being something that caused them a great deal of pain. Uh, one, one community member said, I think if I'd had a stronger culture, we would have lived differently. It would be better if we had those values. We would be stronger as a community. Uh, when I was little, I thought it was normal. My mom woke up with a beer. Not my mom, by the way, uh, if she's watching. Uh, my mom woke up with a beer, and I thought that's what you did. I didn't know. So maybe we need to show the kids that they don't need to do that. Um, and so we conceptualize the trajectory this way, that you start from that place of historical trauma, those intergenerational losses, and, and, and even, even the way that the society that you live in reflects that you're of little importance, then, then that contributes to the health-demoting behavioral practices that you experience, and then that can lead to greater risk of HIV, hepatitis C, and then STIs. The risk factors for a lot of those are the same. Um, so, so our program philosophy, and I have very little time, I, I'll just break it down this way. We talk about decolonial praxis and, and all this stuff, but really, if what people are telling us is that the loss of Native culture is, is what's creating a lack of wellness, then it just makes sense in our programs to, to bring that back to them. And so we employ uh, culture as the foundation of what we do in our prevention work, what, rather than starting from a place that privileges Western knowledge. Um, I have some data here from Baltimore City Health Department, and uh, the, the numbers are pretty low. Um, I want to move to this. So the um, opioid overdose prevention programs, so the Native American Center and the National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day, that's a little over 60%. Those are just two separate events that our program led. And then the street outreach and the detention center, um, that's over the course of a year. So that's how many people we're seeing. It's, it's disproportionate to, to what the city is reporting just over a year. Um, 
I'm wordy. I'm going to go through this. Uh, 29% American Indian and Alaska Natives reported uh, as infected with hep C. Um, this is the thing that got me. In 2016, it said that there were no living HIV cases or new HIV positives identified as American Indians, Alaska Natives in Baltimore City, which was shocking to the HIV positive American Indian friends that I knew who were or living engaged in treatment in Baltimore. And data really matters, and I think that's the, the important thing that I want to say. So Baltimore has been an epicenter of injection drug use for uh, a really long period of time, and so our Native people are living in that same environment. And if you looked at where our people live, um, in, in East Baltimore is where a lot of the Native community lives. That's where you have the biggest pockets of um, HIV rates, but our people aren't being counted. Um, when, when you test for HIV in Baltimore, you can be white, black, Asian, Latino, or other. So our people aren't being counted. So if there's no data, then if, if you are trying to, let's say, get a grant and make the case that you have this need, you don't have the data to support you have that need. When outside entities are saying that they want to create prevention programs for us, well, if you don't have the right data, you're not targeting the community that you need to target. So it's of very little value. But the other important thing is that othering us as Native people dehumanizes us. And that goes back to the trauma impact. And one of, uh, one of our community members said the Lumbee, which we see a lot of Lumbee folks, aren't federally recognized. Other Native people try to act like we're not Indian. They say we're black. They put us down, and it makes you feel real bad. So people are absented in data, and then they're just not seen in society as Native people. We had two murders in our community uh, over the last year. Um, one was listed in the data, two women, one listed in the data as white, the other listed in the data as black. Both were enrolled members of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. So the data collection practices are very poor. Um, and so the way that we try to address HIV AIDS in our community and prevention is to honor the native identity of the people that we were serving. One of my mentors in college, uh, Dr. Pamela Jumper Thurman, was uh, important in starting National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day, and it's something that I have kept up. So we started started very early on with the help of Elton Naswood and Dr. Patrick Chalk, who was the HIV Bureau Chief of Baltimore City Health Department, and had, had a small event. At that time, Dr. Chalk went out to the HIV testing vans and instructed people to collect not only American and Alaska Native as a, a racial and ethnic category, but also to get the tribal affiliation of the people that we live. So acknowledging not just uh, our, our status as Native people, but the people from whom we come. And so every year we gradually have larger and larger um, native HIV AIDS awareness days. And, and why are those important? Because if I say to you, hey, Saturday, come and get your HIV test, or, you know, a lot of people in our community are not going to want to do that. But if we say, hey, we're having a round dance, and if you get tested for HIV, you know, you'll get a voucher for a free Indian taco. So, so we're using culture as a way to engage the community, providing uh, information on HIV and hep C prevention, um, Narcan training in that environment, and then getting people tested. So again, it's really elevating and privileging Native culture in the way that we are providing information to the community, and in that regard, using the culture as prevention model uh, has, has more... Um, efficacy in our community. So um, sorry that I rushed so much. I thank you um, very much. This is for all of my Navajo in-laws. And um, just thank you again for uh, listening to a little bit about our program. Oh, thank you. I, I, the good news is I, I don't, oh, I just, I do have a, a I didn't think I was going to have a green button problem. But uh, oh, I guess well, I don't. Because I didn't prepare a, a PowerPoint. I was just going to talk a little bit about where policies interjected with us as practical programs. Uh, we've had a, uh, several different grants from the CDC and SAMHSA for HIV, and mostly dealing with outreach and testing. But this last particular one we had was uh, integrating primary care into, uh, or primary care management of HIV, uh, integrating that with behavioral health care. Um, the Urban Indian Clinic in Phoenix that I'm a... Uh, proud to be the CEO of, was the first facility in the state of Arizona to get an integrated license as an outpatient uh, treatment center. And so we integrate very well between behavioral health and primary care. 
and having that SAMHSA grant allowed us to uh, add another component to it in looking at uh, uh, managing HIV uh, persons with HIV positive. But we've, we ran into a, a few issues. One was uh, where do we get training for our primary care providers uh, in, in managing HIV positive individuals? And that was very difficult because the answer was the U of A in Tucson. So we're in Phoenix and they had to get uh, training in Tucson. So having that training accessible to our primary care provider and, and team members was, was, was difficult. But uh, one of the things that we've learned in our outreach uh, with HIV is that um, really you have to adopt to the, the um, community that, it, that uh, where HIV is very prevalent. And that was difficult for us to do as we're a primary care uh, facility dealing with mostly maternal and child health programs. But uh, getting our, uh, once we did that, we found ourselves being very, very effective at finding that community, uh, people willing to take tests for HIV, and also uh, what we what we have found in the last five or six years is a higher prevalence of uh, hepatitis C. So looking at those HIV communities, we've uh, really uncovered, I think in the last three years, we've had uh, eight positive HIV tests, but something like 37 uh, people diagnosed with uh, hepatitis C. So those are the things that uh, we've been learning as we've been doing this. One of the things about the, uh, the little blue dot that, that we saw was so the Weinwright provider isn't actually in our city. It's in a city south of Phoenix in, Mar in Maricopa. So accessing those funds for those is, is gonna be difficult because it's, it's not gonna be available to us or working with that provider, it's not gonna be available to our community even though Phoenix has been one of those blue dot identified places. So while it's in that county, it's not in the actual area where we're finding urban Indians to be living. Um, one of the things that we're excited about is the we've been a PrEP and PEP provider for a while now, and getting the uh, Ready, Set, PrEP program is pretty, is pretty nice. Uh, a couple of things that uh, the providers had uh, said to me was, you know, the three things on the Ready, Set, PrEP, was that they have zero drug coverage, which is pretty easy to learn our population, that they're HIV negative, and that we provide them a, a, a prescription for PrEP. But uh, one of the other things that they noted, because we, we are, you know, serve American Indians in FQHC urban Indian setting, they thought maybe making broader categories that might make it easier for the people, people that ac access our clinics, broader categories like making it, uh, like immunizations, making it available to American Indian Alaska Natives, or making it free to any ITE provider, or making it free to any FQHC provider. Those might be broader categories that would catch um, the populations that we serve that might be at high, that we identify as high risk for PEP and PrEP. Um, as far as HIV or Hep C goes, the the where we've uh, hit some roadblocks in in the treatment or of Hep C has been in the um, has been in the prior authorization in managed care environment. Very, very difficult in Arizona as, uh, as there is a fee-for-service program for American Indians, Alaska Natives, but they have the same uh, conditions of prior authorization for medication on, on hep C medications. And so that's been an issue uh, in providing uh, care to those positive for hep C. So I have hit my stop limits, so thank you. Thank you to Ms. Hocklassard and Mr. Murillo for the informative presentations on community support and policies surrounding HIV and hepatitis C prevention and treatment services at urban Indian organizations. And thank you to all of our presenters and participants in this listening session on this critical topic. We now want to open up the floor for some discussion um, among our presenters as well as in-person attendees and those who have joined us virtually. Um, in-person attendees, if you have any questions or topics to discuss, please come to the left side of the room with Cebu. Cebu, can you raise the microphone right over there um, to provide any comments or raise any questions that you may have. If you would like to speak and you are attending virtually, um, you will see a pop-up poll question um, that will be available for you to provide feedback. You also can use the raise your hand feature to have your microphone unmuted and speak um, and ask a question that will be heard by all of the presenters here. Um, 
feel free to take those polls at your leisure if you are joining us virtually. So I'm going to now open it up if anyone has any questions or comments they would like to discuss. Can I ask myself a question? Just kidding. Um, so for folks on the panel, and, and um, I just want to give a shout out to the Nakui board who's here today. Uh, woo -woo, good job. Um, uh, so we know that we want everyone to get screened for hep C and HIV that comes through the door. Um, what are some of the barriers to that or that you've seen, um, and if you, ha if you have or haven't implemented that component yet? Um, what are some things that IHS could do to support you? I could just speak on behalf of Oklahoma City. We've had universal testing because we have been very active with our GIPRA reporting for quite some time, and because that's one of our standards of care, um, it's led us to make sure that we um, screen everyone. I, I, most important, um, Danica hit on it in her talk, was access and having access points um, throughout the clinic. We are a comprehensive outpatient clinic, and so when I'm out speaking to non-Indian community and talking about the services that the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic provides, I tell them we have everything on our campus that you would see except inpatient. So that allows us um, a little bit of flexibility, but we have a moderate complexity laboratory that is um, kind of right in the middle of our patient-centered medical homes. But we've also put some point-of-care testings out in the outlying areas, and so we operate out of three buildings, soon to be four, and um, each one of those has access points. And so we also have patients that might just come in for dental care or for behavioral health services or just to use our wellness center. Each and every department screens those patients just like we would if we saw them on the medical side to make sure that they have had testing. So I can't reiterate that um, enough about no matter what kind of services you provide, that those screening tools are available and, um, again, um, ask in a manner that are culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate so that you get the feedback from your patients where they feel comfortable uh, answering in the appropriate way. Francis, I, I think being an outreach and referral, so again, we're not providing direct medical services and, and we have to really rely on our uh, relationships with other healthcare providers to get our clients the things that we need. Um, it's also difficult if we were to seek funding to try to provide support around getting tested. Um, a lot of grants uh, exclude urban Indian health programs. They're, they're just reserved for tribes, and so that's really a hindrance um, for us to always have access to the funding streams that we need to, to make testing available to folks. And then in terms of the clients that we see, um, you know, the issues or, or the risk factors that um, lead into HIV are those sort of syndemic things and the social determinants of health factors, uh, the emotional distress in our community, the substance abuse in our community, the lack of housing, the lack of transportation, the lack of nutrition services that our community members have. So, you know, a, a holistic approach is really needed to completely address um, the HIV epidemic. And I think we don't talk about that enough, that it's not just this, you know, bloodborne pathogen and we're trying to treat that, you know, to treat that, but it's a whole person issue that we need to wrap our arms around. Thank you. Uh, great. My, my name's Nick Walsh. I'm, I'm from the World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization. Um, Department of Communicable Diseases. I work in, I'm the regional advisor for viral hepatitis. Work with, uh, we work in HIV TBR unit uh, department. But first of all, I, I, well, we're invited here and thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to listen. Um, you know, it's fantastic the work that you're doing. Uh, obviously, there is so much more happening in this, in this country. Um, 
you know, we uh, just a couple of comments. One is that, as has been mentioned uh, by a couple of the panelists, you know, we we have drugs that can prevent transmission in ninety percent, ninety seven percent of HIV cases. We have the tool. We have a, a cure, ninety eight percent cure in the field. I mean, we really have the tools to be able to do these things. So we really have no excuses at all. The, all the community should have access. Um, at the World Health Organization, uh, I just. I'm going to speak for about a minute and a half or two minutes. I hope that's okay. Um, what we are is an organization that has a director general. The board of directors are the countries of the world, of which the United States is one member state. So that's how we as PAHO work as well. Member states get together, they tell the director general, the organization, what to do. The organization does it, reports back to member states. In uh, 2016, the World Health Assembly, uh, which is the board of directors, countries of the world, including the United States, signed to eliminate hepatitis and HIV as, as public health problems by 2030. So we, as an organization, are working towards that, every country, every community. There's epidemiological definitions of that. Um, the second thing that we do is we do normative guidance. So, And I, I just wanted to let you know that the the new guidance for the treatment of hepatitis C for the first time last year contained a, a section on uh, hepatitis C among indigenous peoples. That was, so that was the first time, um, which is good. Now hopefully we can replicate that in other disease categories as well. Um, uh, and and uh, I, our region, Pan American Health Organi Organization, uh, last year the member states approved a policy on ethnicity and health which took an intercultural approach towards addressing disease, non-communicable communicable diseases uh, in, in countries. So the USA signed to that as well and we can share that. Um, finally, uh, I just wanted to mention also that in Saskatoon in, um, in September next year, the World Indigenous Peoples Viral Hepatitis Conference will be held and this is an opportunity for indigenous, non-indigenous people working uh, in the field of hepatitis in indigenous communities to come together. Um, it's a global conference. We'd encourage as many people from North America uh, to attend. Uh, we can share information about that. But So that's just information. But I want to congratulate you. Uh, if there's anything we as PAHO can do to support uh, the United States as a member state, we support through with CDC. Uh, work that happens here as well, and, and we're here as a resource, uh, so let us know. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Yes. I have some ideas. Unless you want to answer something? No? Go ahead. Please. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so very much for that wonderful panel of discussion that we just had. Um, so I'm Sean Trotter. I'm from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and uh, we kind of discussed a lot of things, and I kind of got a long list of questions. Uh, but so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to shotgun it out, hoping that, you know, because it's a couple of things that I'll be interested in knowing. Uh, first uh, question is going to be related to uh, Rick and how you highlighted uh, MSM uh, individuals and uh, trans health issues related to this. And just what are we actually seeing around uh, the outreach strategies related to that population within this community, how that's actually being um, uh, uh, really looked at and effectively doing outreach. Uh, the other issue is, um, as Ms. Lesnar, as you actually spoke, the overarching area that I'm hearing when you're kind of describing, it might be correctional facilities and what are the issues uh, related to individuals who might actually have contact with that and how we're able to actually uh, continue to provide the care that's actually needed for individuals who have contact with correctional facilities. And then the last thing is um, when we're looking at populations, and all of you have kind of mentioned this, is that we are talking about um, numbers that you know aren't necessarily pe peaking. So how are we actually monitoring patient privacy and making sure that they're secure and um, they're really just safe overall, both as they encounter uh, the healthcare facility, but more importantly, when they go back to the community? I'm happy to go first, uh, talking to your question about MSM and our trans health programs. <clears throat> At IHS, our mission is to raise the uh, health of American Indians and Alaska Natives to its highest possible level. And those American Indians and Alaska Natives don't say just the straight ones, just those who are cisgendered. 
it's all of us. So we, we take it to heart, and we have uh, uh, listening uh, sessions that happen regularly. In fact, I was engaged in one in the lobby before this meeting started. We have a IHS LGBTQ and two spirit work group. We're talking about things like integrating our health information system, our electronic health record, to include things around sexual identity and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. How we make those patients welcome in our clinics from the the second they walk in the door. People are asked, are going to be asked soon, um, what is your name? What name do you like to be called? What gender do you identify at? What pronoun do you use? And that will carry with them through the whole visit. Um, we also have a website. We have an IHS uh, website around LGBTQ and Two-Spirit Health where we're training providers how to get access to uh, information on providing the best kinds of service. But we also know that, um, you saw the statistic, more than 78% of our folks living with HIV who identify in the system as American Indian Alaska Native are men who have sex with men. So we know we need to concentrate on that population. We need to make sure that we have policies in place that do specific outreach and reduce stigma around our MSM folks. And that stigma doesn't extend to just those people who are identifying as two-spirit or LGBT or trans. It's the stigma from our whole entire communities around people who need treatment. It's stigma with our providers. So we're working really closely with uh, communities and providers to get the message out about reducing stigma. The, the need to bring HIV education and prevention and treatment. Uh, we're, we're seeing that probably about 70% of our providers have never even heard about PrEP. Most of the folks who um, are going to need access to PrEP are people who identify as MSM, men who have sex with men or transgender women. So um, we're working really hard to make sure that they don't have to live through stigma going into a clinic asking about it because just the mere fact of someone admitting, I, I think I need to be on PrEP, that means you're, you mean you have sex, you know? <laughs> so we, or you have sex with same gendered people. So that's the stigma that we're, we're concentrating on. So we think it's incredibly appropriate and very important. And we're luckily that uh, our leadership promotes that. Our leadership announces that at all the meetings. Our, our principal deputy director always talks about the need to reduce stigma. So um, a lot of our energy, uh, we have very little funds. The, the little bit of funds that we get come from the Office of the Assistant Secretary through our OIDP funds. Um, but we do see it as a priority, and we establish policies that address MSM and, and trans folks. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, which I, I struggle with doing that. Um, with regard to um, corrections, the state of Maryland used to have a wonderful program uh, that we participated in called Exit Orientations. And the gist of those programs was that, you know, before someone was released from corrections, you had the opportunity to meet with them inside to find out the type of treatment that they needed and then kind of create a plan with them to engage in treatment once they were released. And that was particularly critical for people who were on antiretroviral therapy. Um, where that system would break down is that once that individual would hit the streets, they often didn't follow up sort of the way that we, we planned. Um, the other issue with regard to data collection is if you're not identified as American and an Alaska Native when you're going through the correction or the, you know, the judicial system, I'm not going to necessarily know who you are who you are. So it, it makes things complicated. Again, like a broken record, getting correct data is so important in making sure that our people get the care that they need, but that, but that we're seen. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that's been really beneficial uh, in the state of Maryland and, and for all states who are able to benefit from Medicaid expansion, you know, prior to, to that, um, it was, even with, Mad, with um, ADAP programs, you know, giving people access to, to all the drugs that you're saying are out there, um, you know, that could prove difficult. And, and that, just, that just shouldn't be. So, um, you know, getting people while they're, they're still um, in the correctional institution and helping them plan for their aftercare, um, I think is really smart and really important. But just making sure that we're counted and, and seen as we need to be is huge. I'd like to reply to a lot to the uh, the MSM regarding our community, the urban community in Phoenix. You know what we discovered was uh, the peer, the idea of peers, uh, 
doing the outreach to to MSM was really important, but also of the general LGBTQ community. So we couldn't just be the Indian center where you went to get tested. We had to be to that LGBT. We had to adopt a whole community to be one of the community resources. So we're one of we were one of only two places, like on the county public uh, website that were that did uh, HIV testing. So it wasn't it wasn't really just about uh, you know going to the clubs and having your outreach workers working you know odd hours and allowing that and understanding that that's what you needed. It was also understanding that you're adopting a whole other community that you're inviting into service. You have to be flexible enough to do that to be successful enough to get those American Indians, Alaska Natives that need to be identified as HIV positive in for testing. And in Oklahoma City, it's been important for us to make sure that the community knows that they're included. And so we have a LGBTQ inclusive policy and, um, and all are welcome on all of our facilities. Our clinic was just awarded a human rights campaign, 100% for our work that we're doing in the community and um, making sure that all of our Indian patients, regardless, know that everyone is welcome and that they're going to come in and um, receive comprehensive care with no stigma or judgment. Twelve out of our 21 doctors have all gone through LGTBQ training so that they know how to address um, the questions and pose those questions on what's important. Our intake forms already have the pronoun, the names, how they want to be referred. And so um, just, again, being proactive and being in front of, of uh, what is important to our patients. Do we have some uh, questions online? We have 52 people that have joined. Well, thank you everyone for the great questions so far. Um, one thing I thought it was important to discuss um, among our panelists as well as some folks in the audience um, is if any UIOs have seen certain barriers to, um, as mentioned, there are some medications that can help with both, both of these. And have you seen a lot of barriers to obtaining or distributing some of these medicines, um, like PrEP for instance, um, or any best practices that you can share? I, I mean, with hepatitis C, I think the main barrier is cost. I mean, as everyone knows, three months of therapy in the United States can cost $90,000. Um, and so it's huge to um, use those patient assistance programs um, to the full extent that they're available to you, um, as well as um, reimbursement and building those relationships. Um, I know I've had... Um, some outreach or some discussions with some Gilead representatives that there may be some funds available there um, to help patients with transportation and things of that issue. That's not something that we use, um, but they have reached out um, for those sorts of things because I know transportation is a huge barrier to treatment as well. Um, knowledge, I will say, um, in a primary care setting, when we first began, providers were very hesitant um, to treat hepatitis C. It was um, scary to them. They, you know, didn't know anything about it. Um, and ECHO, uh, Oklahoma State University, is not the only um, college. I think most colleges around the nation now um, are starting or have started and have multiple ECHOs available um, for many, many disease states. I will say that's where majority of my knowledge came from is from ECHO. Um, our OSU ECHO was meeting um, every two weeks and we had so many cases that we couldn't get through um, that we had to go to meeting weekly. Um, and then there's also 30 minutes of didactic that's available. It's still every two weeks with our ECHO um, to gain knowledge in CME. Um, so that's been huge to um, decreasing our access barrier as well and not having to refer um, out in those cases where a specialist consultation is needed because ECHO satisfies that. I just want to do a quick plug for Indian Country ECHO uh, through IHS and University of New Mexico and Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. If you search Indian Country ECHO, you'll find a lot of opportunities for a variety of ECHOs that happen weekly or monthly. And then our UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, we've organized a warm line for hepatitis C treatment. So you can actually talk to another physician on the phone at specific times of the day. Uh, 
Great, thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, since it's a listening session, I'd really like to talk about that money I heard you talk about, Rick. Um, so, th there's 25 million that was um, uh, put into the budget, the president's budget, proposed. And how's that doing in the appropriation process? Uh, to my knowledge, the House has approved it, the Senate has not. So, there's budget consultations and committee meetings still going on. Still going on. on. Okay. Um, so, I, I would like to talk about how that would get used. Are there any estimates of how, um, of what it would take to um, pot potentially provide prep to our high risk populations in the Indian Health Service? I don't <laughs> have an answer for that, but thankfully we have ready set prep that we don't need to wait for the 25 million because we have ready set prep. And I think we're at such a strong advantage because in our clinics people are not going to have to pay for labs or clinic visits. Mm -hmm. uh, people outside of Indian healthcare organizations will get free prep, but they still have to figure out a way to pay for their clinic visits and their lab tests. Okay, so we can go forward. But so I, I'm concerned that, that that's going to get, I mean, that's only, ready set prep is what, only 200,000 people, you know, and then the money's gone. So I'm concerned that's going to get eaten up pretty quick. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm worried just about the Indians and making sure that we get prep mm -hmm. for all Indians, you know, our patient population. Um, you know, ultimately, I'd like to have you know testing for all of our patients, mm -hmm. prep for all of our high risk patients, and and treatment and care for all of our positive patients. You know, and and I and I I'm, I'm trying to think about how we can make that 25 million dollars do that. Uh, does that sound reasonable? I mean, does that? It sounds reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're doing these listening sessions and, and tribal consultations. This is what we need to hear, and our leadership will hear it, mm -hmm. and decisions will be made after we have consultations and uh, confers. So it seems if, if there's a program that was set up, something like the CHEF program, mm -hmm. where it's a as needed. So like if you have a high cost patient at your facility and you get reimbursed as the patient uses the money up, um, or if you have a number of patients that are on prep using the money and your facility gets reimbursed and uses that $25 million, whether it's an IHS, urban, or tribal facility, and then that's how that $25 million gets spent on an annual basis, you know, that's how we could make sure that it gets distributed to the patients that actually need the funding rather than doing this grants or, or out. It would be a real way to make sure that we're actually getting it to where it needs to go. I like the way you think. Right? <laughs> I'll certainly say that. I okay. really think our key is getting uh, treatment as prevention to the folks who need it. And, and, and so it can be for all of those things, right? Per, uh, per prevention, it can be for um, treatment, care, testing, and prep, right? Prep yes. and prep? Yes, okay. it can be. Awesome. Um, so I, I, just, I just wanted to put a plug in also for, uh, for Nick. I, I really appreciate Nick being here uh, today I'm, um, and the WHO. I'm um, uh, the, the incoming m member to the United Nations, thanks to Nakui and the Nakui board. Um, and um, we're uh, going to be working on a pre-session for the United Nations Permanent Forum um, on Indigenous Issues this coming April. Um, uh, specifically about HIV um, and AIDS prevention uh, in indigenous communities around the world. And one of my goals specifically is to work specifically on this issue. And, and uh, you know, m there should be prep for indigenous people around the globe. And, and this is not a hard thing. We should work on it. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, that Gilead is, is producing generic prep uh, for other countries in the world. Is that, is that right? I don't know I that think so. Gilead produces a generic version. There's well, another, Gilead owns the patent. Yes, uh, the generic patent. soon to expire, um, right? Uh, I Gilead think they have the a generic of Clusa R. Harvoni. I do not know about PrEP. Yeah. Gilead owns the generic. You probably know this, Nick. Uh, well, I mean, just on prices, you know that um, currently you can get cured for hepatitis C for $129 in the Americas. Uh, and for prep, you're talking a few dollars a year. Um, so there are some other cost things that if we could have some flexibility from HHS and FDA, we might be able to get some 
lower cost issues. I know that's probably beyond what we can do right now. But, um, you know, globally, there are some other cost issues that we can really uh, deal with. So th those are some of my goals. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I work at the Urban Indian Program in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and um, really appreciated all of your comments. Um, one of the things regarding funding, funding is always a challenge for us, but we've had some success with getting state funding. And we actually, I would say that 80% of our HIV and HCV funding is from the state. And, um, you know, one of the things that we added to our continuum of care, because I think this sort of gets at what Carrie was saying about outreach being really important and leveraging resources with community providers, especially those that are serving the target population, um, is that, you know, um, we do uh, harm reduction and um, syringe exchange, and we frequently do that partnering with other community centers and organizations that are also serving that population because we feel like we have to have the most reach with the limited funding that we're getting. So I wanted to add that. And then also, um, the other thing that we're also doing to um, address HIV prevention among Native Americans is we're, we're doing the testing and the treatment, but we're also doing the DEBI interventions um, that provides more intensive levels of prevention education to high-risk groups. So we've been also combining that as well, again, to try to reach as many individuals who are at risk so they know their status and also trying to leverage those dollars to the maximum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I'd, I'd actually like to ask a question, so I, just to have to comment. And, um, the goal of elimination, because I, I know Cherokee Nation has an elimination goal for hep C. Is that something, this is a real question, is that something that's replicated in all uh, health services serving uh, indigenous people of, 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 the, of this nation? Or is that this, this concept of micro-elimination, elimination in a facility or a population? I mean, is that... I can only it? talk about it in my facility. Yes, that is, my, that is definitely our goal. But I, I don't, you know, looking at it from across the board with the federal sites, the tribal sites, and then the 42 urban programs, I can't speak for everyone. It I probably would, gets, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. <laughs> I was going to say it probably gets a little confusing because we're all going to say the same thing. We don't speak for everyone. And I think a lot of people have this misconception that there's one agency that speaks for all. Uh, native organizations, and that's not the case. But I will say for IHS, yes, we have elimination goals for hepatitis C. <laughs> I'll be the first. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I, I agree that everyone wants to eliminate hepatitis C. I think um, Cherokee Nation um, has Dr. Mira, who is a very boisterous and um, well known and um, I mean, he's a great guy. He runs the OSU Echo, um, and so I think that is why you, you hear about that. Um, but I would say everyone absolutely wants to eliminate. Um, Oklahoma, unfortunately, I think is um, last second to D.C., which our committee says is not a state, so we're the, we're the last state. Um, and so we have an elimination steering committee. Um, so I think absolutely everyone wants to. Um, I think... Uh, Cherokee Nation just has a really great voice in Dr. Mira, and so it's a little more well-known. I, I think that's certainly, a, a, again, a goal. It is a struggle for tribal citizens who are living outside of their reservation communities to access the basic health care services that they are entitled to receive through that trust responsibility. So that really complicates things. So it's the goal, yes. Is the money there to meet the goal? No. I think that uh, living in Phoenix and the stigma that somebody might have uh, if they're MSM on a reservation, they, they come to Phoenix. And so I think that uh, it's a good place to to try to have the zero goal, but our population is so mobile on and off, on and off, on and off the reservation that I think that we'll always 
in order to achieve that zero goal, we'll always continuously have to do this outreach and continuously have to do the, the activities that we're all doing. Um, thank you all for all of your uh, information out. I think that most of us are still working on the right path to try to address this as broad as possible, including trying to work with our youth so they're paying attention and tr trying prevention at the younger and younger level, which is also surprising in some ways that we have to start at such a young age so that they're careful because many of our homes have... Um, I guess, uh, unhealthy environment, so you're not quite sure what they go home to every day from school. So we continue to do this work at a younger and younger age. I, I agree with what Carrie said and with what Robin said earlier about what IHS can do to support us is to allow for us to have access. And I really like your idea. I'm sorry. I just wanted to give you some credit for that, was if we have an issue, because it's similar to what has happened with IHS funding before. The pot is not big enough to cover everybody if we divide it equally or we build some formula or we do something else. But it, with this approach, it's going to provide that direct support. And I'm, I also can't speak for everyone in the room either. I'm the CEO of my facility with about 25,000 patients, but that I'm one facility out of many. So, But it, whatever we can do to spread the word, to keep talking about it, and keep it on the forefront of all of our agendas as we're developing our outreach, our legislation, our information campaigns, and our prevention campaigns, the better we're going to be as a society. We don't want to uh, make anyone feel like they're not welcome in any of our facilities, and we don't want them to feel like, oh, you have been diagnosed with X, now that's something else, you go over here. That is also what we're not trying to do. We want to make sure that we're being as inclusive and participatory and supportive as possible. And that's the one thing I appreciate about all of my peers, CEOs in this room, is all of us are working hard to find that way. And, but also knowing that our denominator is always going to change. Because we do have a, I don't have a large, as large of a um, mobile patient population as you may have, Walter, but I do have quite a few. So it, it does allow for us to at least keep continue down this road and continue to support that initiative. And it's not enough what small amount of money we get from our direct, from our individual uh, urban contracts is not enough to address this issue in a comprehensive way to support our population. Me alone, I have 138 um, diagnosed hep C patients right now, and uh, 22 HIV patients. And all of that requires a lot of intense support and training for these individuals. And without additional resources, it does, it's, it's a burden on the patient, which is not fair to them. We have resources available to us. We've got to figure out how to get it to them to help solve this and support them. Thank you. I'd like to add something to that. Um, so I think one of the things that we noticed in general um, is um, our, I'm seeing a theme here of flexibility in funding um, to be able to do what that community specifically needs it to do. Um, I've seen sometimes where folks need, um, maybe maybe they have the medicine, but they need transportation um, or, or something like that. And then I guess I would like to suggest um, as well that we, um, our IHS or an HHS look at things that um, are going on outside of the Indian health system. Um, I'm thinking um, specifically, sorry, um, for, you know, no political anything intended of, of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, um, you have, there's an app now where you can, you know, literally find, you know, they're like, okay, you, um, you know, you need birth control or whatever. Let's look at, you know, what state are you in? And then based on the state, depending if you need, um, if they don't accept, if, if you can't bill for telehealth, they make you go in person and they help you schedule something. But if you can do telehealth, you can literally um, have, you can make an appointment with a doctor face-to-face. 
uh, or not even face to face, but like on your phone and you're looking, yeah, video and they do, you know, 15 minute checkup or, you know, anything. And then they recommend, um, what types. And so, um, I know that, you know, you were, they were talking about echo and stuff like that, but I think even maybe IHS getting into 2019, which is hard with limited funding, but trying to figure out where, you know, if I'm, uh, well, if I'm, I am a native person looking for, um, and I'm concerned or, you know, I want to be tested, is there an app or something I can go to to say, where's my nearest ITU facility to get that access or, you know, something kind of out of the box. Um, and then just giving, getting flexibility because we'll see, I hear a lot that programs, you know, they want to implement certain things, but there's these unknown barriers that um, bureaucracy has imposed that doesn't allow them to use that money the way that that's. And, and because um, it was very consistent that we're like, I only speak for my organization, I only speak for my, it's because we need flexibility because every community is different and that is such a theme of Indian health in general. Um, and so I would just suggest that to, um, to include flexibility in there. Um. I forgot one thing, um, and it, ha it had to do with a comment from, from Dr. Brown. Um, I think that uh, we, there needs to be a one-time investment in, from, from your money, Rick, <laughs> in um, uh, education on adherence. Um, with a transient population uh, that, that we have, uh, it's so important for treatment especially, but also for PrEP, that our, our patients understand the, the necessity of adherence with these medications. And so I think we need to be able to have patient education about adherence, 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 adherence. So thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. And we're, we're getting ready to unveil a PrEP Navigator online training that's self-paced, geared mostly towards CHRs and health educators, but also for nurses, docs, pharmacists. Uh, that should be coming out in time for National Native HIV AIDS Awareness Day in the middle of March. Uh, but it'll take people through the process of how to get someone recruited, get them on PrEP, keep them in the system, do really good solid case management. At the same time, we're looking at uh, buying into a platform that is designed for patients and providers to communicate effectively around PrEP care. Do you have any questions? How are you doing? Here's your latest uh, chlamydia result. Uh, but that will translate over into hepatitis C treatment as well and STI treatment and care. So we're really trying to engage people um, electronically. Thank you. And this has been some really great discussion and some great questions. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention, it's, it's very clear that there's a theme of needing more resources. Um, and at the same time, there's a theme of federal importance of addressing these crises and the desire to address these crises. So one thing I wanted to ask, um, I'm very grateful that we have a lot of federal partners, um, in addition to IHS, some other folks from HHS in the room and also attending virtually. Um, and I wanted to ask what are some opportunities to improve the communication between federal partners and UIOs so that some of these resources, some of these initiatives can actually reach UIOs. Um, I know with IHS there's an urban confer policy, but without having those with other HHS agencies, what are some opportunities that we can take advantage of and help facilitate to ensure that some of these initiatives are actually reaching um, UIOs and their patients? Don't all speak at once. Or alternatively, have any UIOs um, experienced some maybe best practices of engaging with some federal partners on these issues? Um, maybe something that can kind of help spur this dialogue a bit. Well, I'm not sure if I've been an advocate for getting more money, although we've received quite a few grants from CDC. But uh, having had those grants, I really do I want to give a lot of credit to the CDC and their technical assistance in helping us implement those grants and, and being successful, I think very, being very successful with our HIV prevention program. And, and uh, so, you know, that being said, I, I think the CDC's done a pretty good job. I would like to suggest before everyone speaks um, that um, a, an easy solution to at least kind of understand more about 
um, the IHSIT system um, or any of our facilities is whenever they're on travel. Um, if you're in an urban area, there are a lot of our programs wherever you are, um, usually. And so um, I would like to suggest that if there's any federal agents that are in urban areas to kind of look and see if there's an urban area, an urban program near you that you could visit and kind of better understand all the things they do. Um, and, 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 and that goes for the I and the T as well of the IHS system. It is amazing what folks do, even with limited resources and, and um, things that are implemented from a cultural um, competency standpoint, or, you know, it's very community based, um, wherever you are, it's severely different in a good way. And so there are things that, um, and I'll just give an example, um, that Linda here um, from New Mexico, uh, she, you know, she asked her patients what they needed. Um, and she has, a, you know, a large homeless population there and they wanted a washer dryer and she has one. And those are, that's flexibility, you know, that's helpful. And um, they really appreciate that. I th and I think we could all understand the importance of clean clothes. Um, and so just to kind of, you know, you would never think of a health facility probably and just think of that for, for patients specifically, um, but they really try to meet the needs of their patients where they are. And so I think it's very telling the services they provide based on where you are. Um, so I would just like to kick it off with that suggestion. Um, and, and I think there's other ways um, that federal agents can um, discuss how urbans can better engage. And just, um, we're using the technical term of a confer. It's similar to tribal consultation. Um, but um, so urban programs have the ability to uh, meet with IHS when it's impact, when there's an issue impacting them. And IHS is required when they're similar to what we're doing right now. Um, to consult with urbans when they're doing a policy. And so for federal um, partners that do not have that um, background for urbans, that's kind of what it is. So in the absence of that for um, other agencies, what other things can urbans do to better engage with you all so you have the information needed to um, make a better calculated decision? Thank you. I just wanted to mention something in regards to your question. I'm sorry. So if any federal um, agency or partner wants to go through NICUI, we, we can definitely connect you with, with the communities. Uh, so just wanted to mention that because they may not know how, but we know how to. Sorry. Absolutely, that's a great point. Thank you, Alejandro. No, actually, he was he he's, he he started something that I was going to make a, make a mention of. I'm, this is Eugene McRae. I'm with Senate, Dr. McRae. I'm for the Centers for Disease Control, and one of the things that we did as part of the planning, we uh, as a part of our planning activity, is encouraged all of the jurisdictions that were being funded to um, to make sure they included as part of the planning the UI, the urban, urban indigenous organizations um, and we gave them that list but what would be helpful I think if, if we could bilaterally share the the uh, points of contacts and and uh, either you know points of contacts for these different urban organizations in the 50 seven or so jurisdictions and and then vice versa we share with you our points of contact so that they know how to get in touch with each other because the planning process is going to be even though they're submitting their plan draft plans in december the planning process is going to go through next year and we know in some communities they know already that there are certain people that are not at the table they won't be able to get them there before december because the, that's a short amount of planning time but they do want to include um, the, them in the planning as part of the process i think that would be one way of making sure we connect the two part the two parties um so and I, I say this because i was just in memphis and memphis um is interested and in, they realize that the, I think there's a community in Memphis or in in that in Shelby Shelby County that the, and they had not engaged them and they wanted to and I wasn't and um, I did we didn't have the contact because we pulled it all from or from the web from your website but we we wanted to make sure we had the contact but we didn't know who the contacts were. Yeah. Um, thanks. I'm Carol Jimenez. I'm uh, with the Office of Infectious Disease Policy at HHS, the Office of the Secretary, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. So in addition to the ending the HIV epidemic, which Dr. McCray just talked about, and um, I'm going to say CDC in particular, and those of us in the rest of the department, IHS, um, we are out there talking with the communities constantly. We've done hundreds. Of, of community meetings and certainly want to include the American Indian um, indigenous population um, and certainly well aware that um, the vast majority 
live in urban areas and not on reservations. But in addition to ending the HIV epidemic um, and, you know, working on things such as HIV, hepatitis, STIs, um, I would say, you know, most of HHS, we have regional offices and um, we can share information and be in touch with our staff in the regional offices and bring them to the communities, but also keep the federal partners, obviously IHS is key, um, but there's other of us around the department that also work in that space and truly wanna do right by everybody and provide the, help people to get the best health care possible and have the best health possible, but keep us in mind um, you know, and maybe we can just have schedule a couple meetings a year where we touch base and see what's going on and keep abreast of the changing needs and how we can be of most help and opportunities for us to meet with people you know, that are coming down the pike. And I, I um, we do have our national conference every year where we do host listening sessions that you're more than welcome to attend. Um, and we do host them, and, and this is um, one of those types of events that we do try to do um, to have folks, you know, gather information that they need. Um, so we can definitely help you get in touch with that. And other national organizations um, serve tribes. They do the same. Thank you. Those are some really great ideas. Um, and I do just want to um, ask Carla to speak. We do have a question that we've received online from a virtual attendee. So um, I believe this is directed to the panel, but I'll open it up to everyone in the audience also. And the question is, has Congress examined uh, HIV AIDS in Indian country? And then second part to that is, how can we make this happen? If, if not, how can we make this happen? If anybody wants to address that question. That Rick Havergate from IHS, I can't say that Congress alone has done any specific examination, but rest assured that the HHS agencies like CDC and HRSA and NIH and IHS and SAM, you know, all those are constantly working in IH, uh, HIV in uh, uh, looking at the stats, who's infected, how we treat it, how we prevent it. Uh, those reports filter up to Congress when they ask for them from our agencies. We do collective data calls quite often. Uh, Carol's office is under uh, close examination because of this new ending the HIV epidemic and we all report to her office. It's a good thing. There's a good eye on what's happening with HIV because of the new ending the HIV epidemic. But unless my CDC or OASH colleagues, I don't know of a single one that's specifically for Congress. Um, I don't either, but um, but I think that there are pro probably opportunities to to make Congress more aware. But I think it's organization like yours that's going to have to make it happen. Um, we do we spend a lot of time on the Hill educating Congress about certain communities, but it's usually driven not by us, but by the communities and I, and organizations like yours that that help organize congressional briefings for staff for for congresspersons, et cetera. Um, so I think that it's something that we certainly are interested and be more than willing to help support and, 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 and provide information, et cetera. But, but um, we don't generally, we can't, well, you know, we, we can't initiate it. So, hi, this is Carla Lott, the Director of Congressional Relations for the National Council of Urban Indian Health. And I can answer um, that question in part. Uh, just because through the work that I do, I do know that there has been an HIV caucus in Congress, and several of your members who are current members of Congress have served in that caucus. And so um, it, thank you for the plug, though, for Nakui and the work that everyone here does. Um, so I know that there is a caucus, or has been a caucus in the past, and they are they are active in ways, and but Congress can always be more active, I believe, on your behalf. And advocacy and what you're doing here matters. Well, and I think there's also just an importance, too, of kind of what Carrie was talking about earlier, where we're, we are oftentimes invisible in data. 
um, including at times CDC data. And so um, there are times where if you mark that you're American Indian, Alaska Native or other, are, or you know, and you're Hispanic or white or black, sometimes they put you in that category. And so even with data, there's definite rooms for improvement there to make sure that we're all counted and respected in our individual identities. Um, so I just wanted to put that there. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions or best practices or barriers or other points of discussion for many folks? Any other questions um, virtually? While we're waiting for potential virtuals, I'm just gonna call somebody out in the audience, Linda, <laughs> because we've worked with you in the past. I just have to say that and, uh, the, for the past year, a lot of meetings I've been going to with constituents who work with HIV keep echoing the sentiment, nothing, how does <laughs> nothing for us without us nothing for us without us and you have been such a great leader in making sure that you're hiring people who represent uh, transgender populations um, men who have sex with men people who have had experience with uh, injection drug use for your outreach program so hats off to you Great. Well, any other questions from folks? Okay. Well, it is just about 4.30, so we can go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I want to thank everyone in the room and online for joining us today. This has been a very great conversation, a lot of productive um, topics discussed um, and issues identified, and I think that this serves as a good basis for us to start to identify some opportunities to work together um, in addressing these crises. I do want to remind folks that we will have a second listening session um, as part of this series coming up in February. Um, all upcoming event information will be located on the NACUI website at www.ncuih.org and also through our e-newsletter. Um, and lastly, we ask that you please take a few moments to provide feedback on today's listening session through the evaluation survey that was passed out or through the survey monkey link that is now located in the chat pod for our virtual attendees. Um, we will also provide this link through a follow-up email. And as always, please feel free to contact a member of the NACUI team if you have any additional comments or questions. Um, and again, thank you so much for attending, um, and hope everyone has a good evening. <laughs>